Hello and welcome to our final video lesson on Chapter 3 from Genes to Proteins in which we'll consider the subject of DNA cloning. DNA cloning is recombinant DNA technology. Two separate DNA molecules are recombined to form a new DNA molecule, hence a recombined or recombinant DNA molecule. Typically a vector or plasmid is the carrier DNA. In the figure at the top of our slide, that plasmid is, is pictured on the far left. This is closed circular double-stranded DNA. We have another, a separate source of DNA that contains the desired DNA sequence. That's pictured on the right of our illustration. The foreign DNA highlighted in blue and the region that we're interested in highlighted in pink. We combine these two DNA molecules the closed circular double-stranded DNA plasmid and the gene of interest from our foreign DNA to form a new recombinant DNA molecule, the plasmid carrying our gene of interest. This is possible because we will digest both DNA molecules with the same restriction enzyme or enzymes. This results in these two separate DNA molecules having the same sticky ends, complementary base pairs. The digested molecules can then be recombined through complementary base pairing of those single-stranded regions, the sticky ends. We can then use DNA ligase to seal the nick in the backbone and therefore produce our final recombinant DNA molecule, closed circular double-stranded DNA, mostly the plasmid with our cloned gene of interest, highlighted here in pink. Plasmids are cloning vectors that are autonomously replicated. That is, they're replicated separate from the chromosome. This is because this is possible because they have their own origin of replication. In the map at the top of the slide, it's not indicated, but they each carry their own origin of replication. This means that although the chromosome is only replicated once in a division cycle, the plasmid can be replicated numerous times so that a single cell may carry as many as a hundred copies of the plasmid. So if we clone our gene of interest into a plasmid, a single cell may carry as many as a hundred copies of that gene, whereas normally only one copy would, would be carried. This is, allows us a high level of overexpression of that gene and makes it easier to isolate and study the gene product. These cloning vectors usually carry non-essential genes. They are naturally occurring in bacterial systems and are a way for the bacterial cell to extend their genetic toolbox, as it were. This confers a growth advantage under certain conditions. These cloning vectors also usually carry what is referred to as a selectable marker. Typically, these are antibiotic resistance genes. In the cloning vector at the top of the slide, it's illustrated as AMP-R, resistance to the antibiotic ampicillin. These cloning vectors also often have multiple cloning site or MCS regions. They contain multiple restriction enzyme recognition sites and this gives us some selection with regard to which restriction enzymes we'll use in our cloning process. The recombinant DNA molecule is then transformed into a host. In this example, we're inserting it into a bacterial cell. This process is actually very inefficient, and so we need a way to select for cells that actually contain the, the plasmid. This is the purpose of our selectable marker. It confers an antibiotic resistance. So we can grow these cells in the presence of the antibiotic. Those cells that lack the plasmid will die, whereas those cells that have the plasmid and can express the antibiotic resistance gene will survive. This ensures, therefore, that all surviving cells carry the plasmid and are overexpressing our gene of interest. That concludes our studies for both Chapter 3 and Chapter 20. In our next lesson, we'll begin our considerations of Chapter 21 on transcription. We want to examine the structure and composition of RNA and compare that to DNA. We also want to establish how we define a gene.